We're here with Paul Mazursky. Paul, uh, maybe we could start with your telling us something about your really early background, where you grew up, went to school, and, and that's I grew up, Paul Mazursky grew up. That's me, I'm Paul Mazursky. Um, I grew up in Brownsville in Brooklyn, which was called as a Murder Incorporated. But Murder Incorporated in those days, I was born in 1930, which makes me, well, I'm eight, I'll be 83 on April 25th of this year. Can you believe it? And I, this wig that I'm wearing is proof. No, it's not a wig. <laughs> it's my hair. I was born in Brownsville, Murder Incorporated. It was safer than Beverly Hills is today. It was safer than California is because the mafia, the, the I would call it the mob, the mob, they took care of the neighborhood so that no nothing bad would happen to you. We lived in a building. I lived in 1935 Bergen Street, Saratoga Avenue, in the same building as my grandparents, my Zeta and my Bubba. My Zeta, my uh, Sam Gerson, was my favorite person in the world. He was very poetic, and I got from him, I think my artistic genes came from from Sam and from my mother. My mother was Jean Mazursky, who was, I would say, bipolar, truthfully. No joke. There's no joke here. <clears throat> there should be a joke, but there isn't. But she was brilliant. Uh, she typed 120 words a minute. She played the piano for a ballet company that gave ballet lessons. They, <clears throat> they offered me lessons, but I was, I didn't, I was afraid to do it. Uh, I was very shy in, in, in a strange way, and my parents was, had a terrible marriage, and they would argue all the time, and in order to stop the arguments, I would do imitations. I would start doing funny things. It's the truth. I started my comedy act at the age of about six in, in, the, in the apartment, and, and while they were fighting with each other, well, I told you to take your shoes off. Why are you doing this? Why do you do that? He says, Baba, and then they see me and I, <laughs> he's so funny. That's funny. He's a funny boy. You should be a comedian. That's how it started. Why am I looking right at the camera? I like the camera, that's why. Because I have a strong ego. Spider-Man. But let me look over here. Now I see this delightful, I see an usher. <laughs> he was an usher at CBS. In 1963, when I was doing the Danny Kay show. And That's before it. that, your grandparents were very important in your lives. My grandparents they died. were very important. Let me tell you about Sam Gerson. Sam uh, lived in a shtetl in Kiev. The shtetls in Kiev were not like the ones. Uh, a shtetl is a, as you probably know, it, it's a, it's 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 their house, uh, and, and Kiev was in in the Ukraine, in the. Uh, they weren't the Howard Johnson shtetls, that were in in the in the movie Fiddler on the Roof, those shtetls were like, uptown shtetls, they were they were bad, and they were they were dealing with Cossacks, bad stuff, where the Jews would be beaten. There's a, a wonderful joke that goes around that tells the, the true story. The Cossack is driving, riding around in Kiev, and he sees a Jew, and he says, Jew, stop right here. Where is Krachmalna Street? Krachmalna Street. And the Jew is carrying two loaves of bread, chalis, they call them, under his arms. He says, well, what, 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 he starts to beat him. Where is Krachmalna Street, you Jew? I, I, I know, here, hold, hold these for a second. Where's Krasmala Street? I don't know. That's a great Jewish joke. <laughs> that tells the story of, anyway, Sam got into the army as a scrivener. Sam Gerson, his name was. The sweetest man, little man. I've, I made a documentary called Yippee about my, and I dedicated it to Sam. You ought to see it. The guild ought to run it. They ought to run it at the guild. Yippee, it's about my encounter with the 20,000 
or 25,000 Hasidic Jews uh, who they go there for uh, Rosh Hashanah to daven and pray and dance and sing. They're crazy. And I went as me. It's quite a good documentary and very interesting. Anyway, Sam got into the army and he couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand the way he was treated in the army. Terrible. So they were on a train and he was scribbling away because a lot of the officers couldn't uh, write. They were stupid, as he later told me. And guess what he did? He jumped off the train. He deserted. My grandfather, little Sam Gerson, deserted, made his way to Hamburg, Germany. Don't ask me how he got there. And met this lady, little lady named Ida Gerson. I forget her real maiden name. And they fell in love on the boat going to America. I should have made that movie, but I didn't. That would be an epic. And they were in the lowest, terrible quarters, but they made it to America. Uh, they got to uh, New York, and he got a job rolling cigars, uh, uh, not grass, cigars. And then other things happened, and he became crippled because a truck came up off the sidewalk and ran him over, ran over him. And they had no insurance, they had nothing. He did not lose the leg, but he persevered. And he was my favorite human being. And he was a writer. Wasn't, he was a Scribner. He was not a poetic writer. He kept, uh, Sam Gerson kept uh, books that I, I have copies of, which I can give you and you can show them, clips from them if you want his collection of photos in the Jewish newspapers or in other uh, newspapers or magazines, uh, things that excited him, pictures of Freud, Kafka, Einstein, the pyramids, uh, wonderful curiosities. He played the violin. Uh, he was very sweet. One of my favorite stories is about my grandmother, Ida, who lived in uh, in Poland, she was Polish, uh, but Poland at that time switched with uh, with Russia, with, with the Ukraine, called the Pale of Settlement. That's where the Jews went. The Jews could not go anywhere else. They couldn't, <clears throat> couldn't own property or anything like that. So Ida, in order to get out of that place, escaped by hiding in a, in a, in a a uh, push cart filled with uh, potatoes. And she was underneath hiding in there. And the guards were too busy talking, who knows what, smoking. And they poked through and it just missed her, the bayonets. And so that's how my mother would always tell the story. Your grandmother gave, gave uh, she almost died getting across the border. That's my mother, Jean. My mother said to me uh, in the next stop, Greenwich Village, which is another story. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's very much about me. A story of a Jewish boy who, who leaves uh, Brownsville and goes to Greenwich Village. As a matter of fact, the Danny K. Writers called me, oh, Mr. Greenwich Village is here. Ah. Oh, good, good to see you again. He's wearing a beret today, Mr. Greenwich Village. He made fun. Little did they know what would happen. And when I became whatever I am today, they greeted me differently. It was interesting. <laughs> it was They were in, kind of in awe. Yeah, sure. You yeah, know, all that stuff. I wanted to be an actor at an early age. I was like, I would say in, in uh, junior high school. No, 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 no. In public school. I Never already seen. was thinking about acting. And I would lie in the ba in the bathtub, and I would go, "To be or not to be, that is the question." Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of being a Jewish boy, <laughs> and I do funny stuff. I acted in high school. I went to Thomas Jefferson High School, the same school, ironically, 
that Danny Kaye had gone to 10 years earlier. And when I mentioned to Danny that I had gone to the same school, his eyes glazed over, like, like pulling the blind down. He didn't want to talk about it. Who knows? Uh, but he was a, that's another story. I can't, back to I can't wait to get to the Danny Kaye we stories. Will, but, but, but in high school? I acted in high school. I played, uh, I don't know what, I got into a lot of plays. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was clear I wanted to be an actor. And then I got into Brooklyn College. Uh, and if you, if you got in, you, you went to school. If you didn't get in, you had to go to school at night. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I got in. Mm -hmm. And the first year, I got all Ds because all I was doing was act, trying to act. Uh, I got into this play. I played Cassius in Julius Caesar. I was very lean then. John Cassius is a lean yeah, and hungry look. And all of the, all of the actors uh, that I worked with there they took themselves very seriously in Brooklyn College. We were, we were actors. We were not students. Uh, I remember them vividly. They were nice. And I was one of them. Uh, my teacher was uh, Joe Davidson, Skipper Joe, the father of Gordon Davidson. And I gave Skipper Joe a, a part later in, uh, I think in uh, Next Up Greenwich Village. I gave him a small part. And Gordon's a nice kid. He's very much like the father. A nice boy. That's another story. So in Brooklyn College, I was now acting a lot. And the second year, I majored in speech therapy. And uh, I began to work with stutterers. And that's an interesting experience because I seriously thought about maybe I should have a backup profession because my mother, Jean, had taken me backstage to see Knickerbocker Holiday with uh, Walter Houston. And I waited backstage. And when I came, he came out, my mother thrust me right at him. Said, this is my son, Irwin. My real name is Irwin. He wants to be an actor, Mr. Houston. And Walter Houston, he was very smart, patted me on the head and says, best to get another profession. If you can, son, it's very difficult. She says, oh, what a wonderful thing. Walter Houston, Walter Houston told my son. And she said, oh, my mother. Anyway, I never forgot it. So I was did backup thing with stutterers. And I learned that stutterers don't stutter when they sing. If you have a group of stutterers and you say Pledge of the Allegiance, they'll go, I pledge. You say, let's sing it. I pledge, let's sing it. And they go, I pledge allegiance to, they stop stuttering. Now that was interesting. So I made a discovery and uh, I, I kind of liked it. I thought seriously about being able to become a, a teacher if I had to. But I didn't. And so when I graduated from Brooklyn College in 1951, I had my first experience with becoming Paul Mazursky. And that's an interesting story, which I will tell you now. I, I was in Stanley Kubrick's first movie. It's called Fear and Desire. I was going to Brooklyn College, and in the first the last four weeks or so of school, no, right before that, I had acted in an off-Broadway play produced by myself and a guy named Bob Weinstein. Not, not the Weinstein, the coincidental name. I believe in synchronicity, by the way. Strange. How come, how come Bob Weinstein in my life? I don't know. I'm, I'm an atheist, but I'm, I believe in synchronicity. Things happen, you don't know why. Anyway, sure enough, I get a phone call. Hello, is this uh, Irwin Bezersky? Yeah. And my name is Howard O. Sackler. I wrote The Great White Hope. 
Oh, it's a wonderful play. You want to pull a surprise? I did. But I've written a movie. It's called Fear and Desire. It's a very important film that I wrote. And I'd like you to meet the director. I think there's a part in the role of Sydney. Would you be willing to go meet him as a part? He lives in, in Greenwich Village. I said, well, I, I've never been to Chicago. <laughs> I've never been to Paris. I may as well go to Greenwich Village. He gave me the address. I go to Greenwich Village. I ring the bell and a voice says, yes? It's uh, Mazursky, Ir Irwin Mazursky. Come on up, fourth floor. I walk up four flights, the door opens, and a guy with black eyes, really piercing black eyes, nice head of hair, a very spare room with like just cameras, camera equipment. And so I, as I remember, and memory plays strange tricks with us, I think he had a dog and he had a wife named Toba. I, I think that was the wife then, yeah. He said, my name is Stanley Kubrick. I want you to read, would you be willing to read for the part of Sydney? I said, yeah, when? He said, now. I said, well, 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 sure. So I read it with him, it took about half an hour. The script was about, the script was mostly uh, descriptions of uh, camera moves, things like that. He said, great, you got the part. We leave Monday for California, for San Gabriel. What are you talking about? I can't go on. I'm, I go, I'm graduating. I'm go, I go to Brooklyn College. He said, you tell, you tell, go tell the dean you got a part in a Hollywood movie. Well, that's not true. I don't like to lie. You got to tell him. If you want to do it, you tell him. That's how it is. You tell. If you want to do it, you tell him. And I'd never seen a guy. He was, he was two years older than me but he was already a little crazy and obsessed in this. So I told the dean, I said, I got a part in the Hollywood movie. Good, I'll give you four weeks, but don't ask for more. Okay, watch the movie. They were interested. I said, I don't know, I, I, I just barely read it. It's, it's called Fear and Desire. Sounds great. <laughs> so I get on a nun, uh, I, I go see the only other actor in New York was Frank Silvera. I don't know if you know who he was. Frank was a great actor. He was an African-American. That's what they called. He was a black guy, the way I talked in those days. Wonderful actor. But he had a strange, his color was such that he could play Latinos. And he often did to get work. So I met Frank. And he talked by Frank called me Sidney. That's the name of the character. He said, Sidney, great that you're you're on board. Well, we're leaving on an unsc you ever flown before? I said, No, I've never I said, I've never been out of Paris. I've never been out of Greenwich Village. Yeah, Wolf, well, I'll sit next to you. It's okay. The flying is easy. It's uh, no nothing to it. We get on this plane, fucking shaking like mad, like craziness. I'm starting to go, this is the end. It's all over and Frank is missing. Anyway, we made it. Uh, we get to California and we're met by Stanley who drives us up into the... No, no, we are driven right to his uncle's house. His uncle was Martin Paveller who gave us the money. He was a druggist. He gave him $20,000 to make this movie. And I'll never forget that. He had an adding machine. And he said, you better come through. You know how many aspirin it takes to make $5,000, $20,000? You better do it. You better, I don't know what it's about, but you better make a good movie. You better do this, you better do this. Stanley says, don't worry, I'll make a great movie. Well, okay. So we're going up there. And meanwhile, he, Stanley says to me and Frank, make a couple of sandwiches because there's no food up there. So Frank and I make sandwiches. We get in the car with Stanley. This actually happened. On the drive up into the San Gabriel Mountains, which is where it was shot at a Boy Scout camp, he started to get enraged, Stanley, in the car saying, 
I'll get an, another five thousand dollars out of him if I have to, and I'll get it one way or the other. I can guarantee, I can guarantee you, I'll get it. <laughs> and guess what he did? He spat in the car at the window <laughs> on them. And I said to myself, "Wow, I got to learn to spit," <laughs> <laughs> which I did later. I started spitting on the set. You know, let's get it places, please, <laughs> on all of you. Anyway, it was an important lesson. Important <laughs> lesson. I made the movie Fear and Desire. In the movie is me and Frank. Two other actors in California named Ken Harp, good-looking guy, fair actor. I don't know. I don't want to be mean. Uh, and a guy named Steve Coit. Uh, he was the other actor, and one actress named Virginia Leith. Virginia was pretty, with a deep voice for some reason. Uh, she was the only one who ever got a job out of it. Um, we had a wire tape recorder. Wire. Wire recorder, which meant that it all had to be synced, dubbed, uh, dubbed later in New York. Because it wasn't in sync with the film. Never at all. Stanley would, it was like in the old days, like what Fellini would do. Move to the left, put, put your head over a little down, go over here, do that, okay. And he'd come over and adjust you. Uh, it worked on that level. We had a small crew, three Mexicans, me, Stanley. Stanley operated the camera. Follow focus was a guy named Bob Dirks, who had been uh, Look Magazine. Stanley was a photographer for Look, and had made two shorts, both of which Bob had worked on, and Steve Hahn who later became a multimillionaire by investing in, uh, oh, uh, what's the thing that makes instant pictures? Polaroid. Xerox. Polaroid. He bought Polaroid. Became $50 million eventually. So anyway, I'm in, I'm in the bungalow with Virginia making out. I'm not yet married. I don't even. Thanks for telling us that. Yeah, it's okay. Betsy knows. And uh, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. I've got the blouse open. My hand is in there. It's a little like, you know, I'm starting to change it. Like, um, here I am, 21 years old, making out in Hollywood. It wasn't, you know, when I hear laughing, and a noise, and I turn and look, and at the window is the entire crew with Kubrick laughing their brains out, bastards that they were. That was the end of my love affair. I later got to rape her and kill her and shoot her in the movie. And in the movie, speaking of synchronicity, I get to sing two or three songs from Tempest, which I had written, obviously Shakespeare wrote it, but uh, Howard O. Sackler wrote it. So there was another piece of synchronicity. I got to sing, Full Fathom Five, Thy Father Lies, Of His Bones Are Coral Made. Those were per and I sang it. And so I got into Tempest, and I never forgot it. And I later made that movie. Uh, later in my life, many years later, with John Cassavetes, who was a great, great friend and a great actor. That's another story. What happened was this, this thing with Kubrick and all of that was a validation to me that I had something. Why me? Why was I chosen out of this? I'm an atheist, as I told you but I'm almost willing to suspend my atheism. If you could explain. No, I'm not there yet, though. So, uh, I started getting acting jobs in New York 
like in, I got it to Blackboard Jungle. That was a nice piece of luck with Sidney Poitier, which I'll tell you about in this moment. I got into Robin Montgomery Presents. I got a Kaiser Aluminum, all the New York shows. And I got some good parts, uh, <clears throat> all on the come. I kept telling him, I'm starring in this movie. And that was a 51. I was still Erwin Lawrence Wazerski. When one day uh, my uh, wife-to-be, Betsy, called me and said, Stanley Kubrick just called and wants to come over because they're putting in the credits. He wants to know what name you want to use. So he's going to come over to the apartment. With you. I said, if, the, if don't let her make a move on you, I'm telling you, he's a viper. And I think he was, in a way. Uh, although I liked him, I, I did, and I have great admiration for him. He's one of my heroes. Uh, Stanley came over. Sure enough, he made a move. She said, stay away and all of that. He says, well, call him up and say, what name do you want to use? So she gets on the phone and they call me to the phone. It, it was a phone number that was given in the phone booth. Outside, I was working in the Catskills as a waiter for a week at the Pesach, Passover. And Betsy says, what name do you want to use? I said, I, I, want, I, want, to keep, uh, I want to keep Erwin Lawrence, but I, I don't want to keep Mazursky as too. It's like, a, I don't know, it's like a communist name. Uh, what about Chad Thompson? I, I, want to, I started making like cowboy names. Buck, Buck Williams, Monty, you know. She says, those are cowboy names. It's not a cowboy movie. You, can, you can't. She said, what about Willard? That's my, my father's name. No, no, no. Willard is too goyish. It's not, not, you can't say Willard, Willard, Irwin Willard. And the operator said, uh, your three minutes are up. I said, she, 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 I said, well, what about Paul? She said, Paul, I, I like Paul. I said, make it Paul Mazursky. I said, I changed my mind. And that's how I became Paul Mazursky, uh, the operator. It's a true story. And uh, my mother always called me Irwin, no matter what. When we opened uh, at Lincoln Center, we opened the uh, first film festival with Bob and Carol, a Hollywood movie, a commercial movie. And it uh, got huge laughs, huge applause huge everything. My mother comes walking in because I had to invite her. She said, Erwin, where do I sit? Or is there no seat for your mother? <laughs> I shriveled. Yes, mom. You know, my mother invented the Oedipal Complex. <laughs> she, she invented it. She gets credit. If you look at Wikipedia under her name, it says inventor of the Oedipus. Anyway. So you acted. I began acting a lot, and uh, the night of the festival is important, though. It, I must tell it in order. We went to the party afterwards, great party. They were really pushing the movie, and I was flying. Here I had a movie that had got more laughs than I ever heard in my life, and I'd already been a nightclub comic. And it was, and I saw Jack Atlas, the publicist for uh, Columbia, walking towards me in the, in the ballroom where the party was. And he had the New York Times under his arm. I knew right away, bad review. And he was depressed. I said, Jack, what's the matter? It looked like somebody died. He says, worse. We got bombed. Canby didn't like the movie. What? Vincent Canby didn't like it. He didn't get it. He, uh, he barely liked. He liked some scenes, but basically, it's it's negative. I said, "Son of a bitch! I hope he fries in fucking hell." And I, all of my flying up, as 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 high as I'd soared, I now went down. I let a critic 
bring me down. Never believe in critics. Take it from me. And I was a critic. I still am for Vanity Fair. I go home that night. I go to the hotel. I'm staying at the Shari Netherlands. It's 7.30 in the morning. The phone rings. I pick it up, and I figure it's one of my friends to tell me the good news that I got bombed in the Times. I said, yeah. Is this Paul Mazursky? I said, yeah. And my name is Pauline Kale. Do you know who I am? I said, of course I know who you are. You're probably the best critic in the world. Ken is a moron. He's a moron. Wow. You made a great movie. Wow. What a great story. I started to cry. I went from that to crying. Because yeah. a critic yeah. told me I was good now. <laughs> it shows you that what happens amazing. to you. She said, you're going to get 19 great reviews. I've already spoken to many of them. Wow. They love the movie. Candy should go back in the fucking closet. <laughs> she said, oh, she was great. We later became very good friends. How did you get from being an actor, which you were succe fr successful I became at? an actor by, by being funny uh, in, in the Second City, where we Larry and I improvised sketches. That's Larry Tucker. Yeah, and the improvisation is a form of writing, mm -hmm. no matter how you look at it. And we were very funny. Larry was little did I know it, but he was he was hilarious, and I was very funny. But I was great on story, mm -hmm. on on moving moving it forward, mm -hmm. on John Howard Lawson. You know, you can't you can't say there's a volcano that's going to erupt and never show it. At least tell it. Make sure they know it happened. How did you get the job on the Danny Kaye show? Perry Lafferty saw me in Second City and offered us a four-week gig because he thought we were funny, and we were funny. Mm -hmm. That's how we got it. So that, that, that's, that's, I didn't say to myself, you're now a writer, but I, would, I began writing, and I could see that a sketch that you do for Danny Kaye is like writing a small movie. It's like writing a three, five minute movie, eight minute movie. It's got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And they did. We already, and when they didn't, what would happen is the, the, uh, the, the story would go to, it would lean out the window and commit suicide because it didn't work. It's a thing, the way we used a, a metaphor. Um, so we were, that's what we were doing. And and sure enough, we got into Second City. And uh, while we're in Second City, I said to Larry, I've got an idea for a, a movie. Uh, let's see, Larry. It's called, it would be I Love You, Alice B. Toklas. Mm -hmm. She made those hash brownies. And the only thing I have in my head is she makes... He, he, that the guy runs out on his own marriage, on a marriage ceremony. He's married by twin canters. And I was bar mitzvahed by twin canters in Brooklyn. So I knew that that was real. I couldn't find twins, but I found brothers. Brothers who, by the way, hated each other. <laughs> uh, they, they did it in, in Yiddish. <laughs> When Warner saw the movie, the morons that they were, the filthy morons, Ken Hyman was scared and made us put in an English translation for the uh, wedding ceremony. This is Alice B. Toklas. Yeah. I love you, Alice B. Toklas. And who, and who direct? You didn't direct that. Who directed I was supposed to direct it. You were? Yeah. I had the job. Uh and I'll tell you how it happened. So, what happens in the in the movie? All I had in my head for a story was he runs out on his own marriage, and someone in the family dies, a family friend, and his mother wants him to come attend the funeral. 
but she wants his kid brother to come too, and the brother is a worthless hippie dropout. So I go see the brother, and he shows up in Indian clothes with marks and see all that, and with a girl, the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life, Lee Taylor Young, who at that time was married to Ryan O'Neill. She was drop dead gorgeous. My heart was pounding. So that's all I had. And he he is going to uh, he's gonna get hash brownies. The same guy. She's gonna mix it up, put it in the brownies, and not tell him she's left him this gift. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's I don't wanna to say too much there. We wrote the script. And we, we basically, Larry and I improvised like mad, and we did some writing, and the Hunt Stromberg Jr. optioned it. Uh, what's his name? Who's that wonderful British actor? Peter Sellers? No, 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 it wasn't Peter. Uh, it's coming to me. Room at the top, but not Albert Finney. Somebody else, very elegant British actor. Oh, come on, Paul. He wanted to do it, said he would do it, agreed to do it. We Lawrence had lunch. Harvey? Who? Lawrence Harvey? Yes, mm -hmm. Lawrence Harvey. You got it. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Harvey, I liked him. Had a cigarette holder, he was Hollywood. He said, it's wonderful, and I can direct it and play the part, and we'll get the money. Hans Stromberg was enthusiastic. Larry and I were sailing. I was going to learn how to make a movie, uh, and because we'd be on set and make it cheap, but not cheap the way I had, you know, more money, like twenty million or something. He never showed up, so I now decided to make it myself, and I got the script of Freddie Fields, who was my agent at that time. And Freddie said that, would you mind if I showed it to Peter Sellers? He said, you know, I formed this company, the first so-and-so, first artist. If he likes it, we'll get it made right away, I'll tell you that now. You might like it. I think it's the funniest script I ever read. Funniest, by far. I said, show it to him, but I direct. If I don't direct it, I don't want to show it to him. You'll get to direct it, don't worry. He calls back about an hour later. Peter's read it and wants to do it and wants to meet. You're in. I said, are you kidding? How could it be that? You're in. Don't even question it. You know the rule in Hollywood. You only need one yes. You got it. <clears throat> you have to go to the Beverly Wiltshire Hotel. He's in the penthouse uh, up there. Who knows what he's doing? He's probably screwing chicks left and right, he loves women. And don't mention directing yet. You're gonna direct it, I'll tell you that. You wanna get there. I said, yeah, but I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, kid, go along with me. Larry and I go, the door opens, we ring the bell, opens the door, it's Peter Sellers. No help, mm -hmm. it's him. And he stares at me, he says, this script I've ever read. It's funny, funny, funny. All I need is the voice of Bernie Petruski, which is the name of the character. I need his voice. I said, better still, there is a real Bernie Petruski, Mr. Sellers. I can get him to come over so you can meet him, because I don't want to meet him. I don't want to meet him, <laughs> not at all. I just want the voice, the voice, you understand, of Bernie Petruski. I said, you got it. And now we were in his spell now. It was a great meeting. We were having fun, we were laughing, we were on the floor. He, he was doing Indian accents for us. And I, I was pretty funny with him. And we left. I called Freddie and I said, I told him what happened. He said, that you didn't mention directing. I said, no, but Freddie, I got along great with him. He said, 
believe me, you got to go slow because he'll turn. He has a way of turning eventually in every relationship. Why? Because he's a paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. So we started to make prepare for the movie. I, uh, Larry and I, uh, Peter went back to London to work on The Voice. I got him The Voice. He came back and I, Larry and I cast it. We found two girls, we narrowed it down, and we said, we want you, Peter, to uh, improve which one you think, because they're both good, but they're very different. One I would say is like dirty, and one is a princess from the, from the heavens. I want to meet the one from the heavens, but let me meet the dirty one first. The dirty one walks in, I forget her name, she was a very good actress, but she was funky, which was real. And he said, she may be dirty, but she's quite beautiful. He liked it. Thank you. We'll not let you know shortly. Would you mind waiting outside, dear? Yes, yes, Mr. Sellers. Beautiful, beautiful. I didn't know dirt could be that nice. Send in the uh, one from the heavens. In walks Lee Taylor Young. Take it from me, your heart pounded. She's the one with the butterfly on her leg. And she dressed that way. She had a butterfly <clears throat> right over here. Peter took a look, pretty much passed out. <laughs> You've got the part, dear. Wow. I'll have to let the other girl know. I'll break it to her nicely. But you've got the role. I said, Peter, don't you think it would be smart to read her a little bit and just to get a, I want to do it right now! <laughs> when he had a temper, you see. Okay, okay. And that's how that happened. And uh, he was desperately in love with her. I mean, she claims it was uh, make-believe that he never, he just looked and stared. He would hold her hand and stare at her. I don't know. So could you tell us something about how, just, you know, because um, writers who will watch this will, will want to learn what you have. Yeah. How it was writing with, with, with your partner, Larry Tucker? Well, the first, the first script I'd ever written was with a guy named Joe Vogel. Uh, that's way back. And Joe was a painter an abstract artist, fairly well known, who, who like many people in their lives, come to a crossroads and decide, I don't want to be a, a, just a painter. I want to write for Hollywood. It's a big mistake. And he was very clumsy. He had very bad English. He was from Poland. Little did I know. And I wrote a script with him called uh, Strawberries and Garlic. It was fair. It wasn't great. And I didn't enjoy the experience because he didn't know how to write. Not, he's dead now, so I, I can say it. But he was a nice guy. Larry was hilarious. So working with Larry Tucker, uh, we didn't say to ourselves, we are now writers. We were doing a continuation of the improvisatory kind of work we had done in Second City. That, that's what it was. And, and we, it bled into writing, per se, because we knew that a sketch had to have form, and we knew that a script had to have form, uh, which we, we were learning how to do. And so I Love You, Alice V. Toklas was that first script. And how did the and what and how did the collaboration go? I mean, would we, you would we, you would you say here's an idea for a story, and Larry'd say that's good, or or shoot it down, or the opposite? Larry would, would never shoot down; he'd only shoot up. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd only approve what I had suggested there, but he'd approve it with humor. Like we, he took me to, for for a good reason. He wanted me to know 
what it was like to be an obsessive overeater. So he took me to White Castle. They made those little hamburgers. And Larry said to the guy, I'll have a dozen uh, uh, of the uh, hamburgers. And the guy said, uh, pack them to go. He says, no, I'll eat them here. You know, that's funny, but it was real. He swallowed them up the way you swallow. Boom, bang, boom. That was Larry. Larry's drawer in his office, when I got to it, one day he wasn't there and I wanted, I was looking to find something, a script or something. He had it all chicken bones. He had swallowed, he'd eaten all chicken. Larry, how is the collaboration? So hard to describe. We were becoming writers, and I would say that it was a great collaboration because it, look, Billy Wilder always collaborated. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Uh, when he wrote by himself, which he did several times, he was even better. He thought he needed a collaborator. So he had Charlie Brackett, and Brackett didn't want to do double indemnity because he didn't like the subject matter. But we said, fine, get me, get me another writer. So they read him one line from Raymond Chandler, short story, and he liked the one line. He said, good, hire him. All, he, all he's doing, I don't need a writer. You don't need a writer? What do you mean you don't need a writer? And Billy says, uh, no, I need a collaborator. I'm a writer. He's not a writer. And he said this to Chandler, and Chandler flipped. He says, no, you're not a writer. I'm a writer. I write novels and stories. You're just making up this Hollywood bullshit. He got angry, Raymond Chandler. There's a delicious play playing now called Billy and Ray. I knew Billy Wilder very well. Anyway, uh, so you would got you two, you we, two would stand up and, and act it out? Was that we, what you would we do? would act out a lot of stuff, uh, not standing up very often because Larry had trouble standing. We got us we rented a house in Palm Springs with a swimming pool. So Larry could be in the water. I had a tape recorder and a typewriter off right around by the pool. And I would type in what we were saying, or I would tape it, you understand, mm -hmm. into a dictaphone. Uh, Bob, he would play Larry, Larry would play Bob, I would play Carol. Then we'd switch, just for fun. And I would be Carol, he'd be Bob. And the switching makes you see the character better. You suddenly realize that's a human being. It's one of the things that most writers, I think unconsciously, I was a feminist already. I was very sympathetic to the plight of women. And I've often said this. In, in those days when, when we made uh, Bob and Carol, the women were, were the puppets of men. They listened to the man. And all these women who had gone to Esalen, which is where I went for the research, uh, they were challenging that. They wanted to be free. They didn't want, they didn't want to have to, to answer to a man. So they asked one girl, why did you come here? And she said, I came because I want a better orgasm. Hilarious line, it's in the movie. Another, a man said... So that line came from real life? Real life, yeah. A lot of lines came from real life. I, I try to make everything come from real life. Real life. Mm -hmm. It's both R-E-E-L life and R-E-A-L life. Life is real. Bob and Carol is a combination of slightly exaggerated and then suddenly very real. In the same movie, when it gets serious, 
when she breaks down, when she's overjoyed, Natalie, when Bob tells her the good news. I've got great news. I had an affair when I was in San Francisco, and I'm happy to tell you about it. That's wonderful, Bob. Thank you for sharing. It's hard to get away with that, but we did. Uh, writing. Writing is tricky. It's, it's uh, collaborating. Well, what you, Larry and I collaborated the way I told you. You said that you, that was really important. You said that you, you would find something in your writing that happened that, that you could define as real and sometimes you would you would just do it that way as if it were real right. and at other times you would push it a little bit slightly exaggerate it so do you think that is a quality that exists in your writing throughout your, yeah, your film? I'm very strong in, in um, irony ironisma I'm very strong where Danny was weak. Danny came. Danny came. Yeah. Yeah. Could you uh, could define that a little more for us? What that means? Well, irony means to me uh, things aren't quite the way you see them. There's more to it, and if you could, if you could, really bring words to it. Uh, the French describe it as. Really, it's, it's another word. Uh, pleasure. They call it pleasure. Mm -hmm. Avec plaisir, which is irony, ironisme. So the audience would see through if to another lucky. truth. Right. They, they wouldn't always get it. Mm -hmm. But when they got it, they got it big time. Um, I. <clears throat> It's hard to describe it, but it's real. I believe it's real. And you and Larry, you know, it's a, it's a gestalt. You have, you know, you have on the left the, what what the left brain tells you. You have on the right what the right brain tells you, and irony is mixing the two together and getting the middle, which is the gestalt. The gestalt is the combination that makes it a, a souffle. The French have wonderful terms. And food. Yeah, and great language for everything. Um, okay, so you and Larry were doing this, and this was yeah. coming out of your sort of improv yeah. relationship. Yeah, Larry never argued with me, so I never had somebody saying, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't need it. I didn't know I didn't need it, but I didn't need it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would sometimes say to Larry, I think this is risky. What do you think? Well, Larry said, "Let's. It's okay. Let's take. What do we got to lose? You know. Don't forget, in a movie, you have the the pleasure of having a preview. But when you go back to the cutting room, you can change everything. And because I was the author and the director of, of Bob and Carol, I." gladly cut 20 pages out of the script. I knew it was too long. It's almost every movie I see now is too long. I call it the 20 minute syndrome. Take it out. Why do you need it all that? You're repeating the same scene over and over and over again. Uh, and that's writing. Going back to the Danny K show for one second. Yeah. Can you remember <clears throat> Anything, because you've told us about these wonderful movies. Can you remember anything that comes to mind in terms of a sketch that you and Larry did? Well, we wrote the uh, the sketches with, uh, I think the guy's name was Giovanni. Oh. Uh, little old shoemaker, something like that. Yeah. And he had a daughter named, played by Joyce Van Patten, who was a modern girl. And uh, it was a, Danny loved those sketches. And those, they had very little irony. They were like, they were commercial. They, Larry and I sold out because Danny loved them. And he asked us to do a movie of them. I couldn't do it. 
I said, I could do it in a 10 minute sketch, but I don't want to do a whole movie with the old man making you weep at the end. You know what I mean? I just, I couldn't do it. I was very strong in knowing what I didn't want to do, which sometimes, look, I don't blame the writers, young writers, old writers. Old writers, I should say that carefully because ageism is a real, it's big. Take me, take you, I don't know. What are you, 52? 72, yeah. A child, a, a child just, you were born saying, 72? <laughs> I like that movie, Benjamin Button. Yeah. Very good. So, so I love that though. So, so, so this early in your career, you didn't really have a writing career when you were writing for Danny Kay. And Danny Kay said to you and 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 Larry that you should make uh, the Giovanni character into a movie. And you, at that point, said no. I didn't want to do it. Larry says fine. He, he understood. Yeah. We just well, we didn't look. We we couldn't do it. We probably could have written it in three days. Um, things like that you can do right off the, over the weekend, mm -hmm. but I, I just didn't want to do it. Yeah. If I probably had I needed money, I would have done it. Mm -hmm. So the so so when you and so you and Larry wrote Toklas, you wrote Bob and Carol, Ted and Alice. Toklas. Yeah, Alice B. Toklas and Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. And Alex in Wonderland. Alex in Wonderland. This is with Larry. H bomb beach party. H bomb beach party. Yeah. Wow. wow. <clears throat> Almost got made. Lawrence Harvey never showed up. Wow. You wrote the. You know, Woody Allen told me when I did the, uh, what do you call it, scenes from the mall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Woody said to me, "Look." It's, this is an ironic thing that's happening where the director is funnier than the star. He said, you're funnier than me, Paul, and you're a better actor. Why don't you star in those movies? I said, I'm not Woody Allen. You are an icon. You can get the money. Mm -hmm. You say, Woody Allen, they want to get the guy who can do this. I told him that. I try to be the star of uh, a couple of movies, they wouldn't do it. I offered to do them free. They wouldn't do it. No. Now, you wrote the, um, I just want to check to make sure this is true. I wrote, you wrote the, the monkey, pilot for the monkeys? Yeah. You and you and Larry? Yes. Sir. So that was a, that was your, that was interesting. That was a TV half hour comedy. Yeah. Well, for Rafelson, for Rafelson and Schneider. Rafelson and Schneider. <clears throat> called us in, we were very hot. And they said, look, we've just done Easy Rider. It's a huge hit. Uh, we want, we have another idea. We want to do The Beatles in America. And we'll make, make up a, a new group and call it The Turtles, whatever you want. And the only thing, we're, we're going to show you help this movie then with the Beatles. So we saw it, and I understood right away what they wanted. And Larry and I are responsible, probably, for creating more shit. The, the, modern, the modern things that are going on, more garbage. Mm -hmm. Fast, boom, bang, bing, bang, boom. And we put it all in this pilot. Mm -hmm. Wipes, mm -hmm. this, costume change, magically this, yeah. now that, now that. And uh, we wrote the song, Hey, Hey, Where the Monkeys, yeah, da 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 Elma Bernstein, who did the music, said to Larry and me, write a song. We wrote, I Love You, Alice B. Douglas, with him. Anyway, the monkeys was a great experience. But then the guys, Rabelson and Schneider, got very greedy and tried to screw us. They had tremendous marketing and merchandising at a time when nobody was doing it. And there was no protection in the Writers Guild contracts, none whatsoever. 
in 19, whatever, whatever that was. 69, 68. Yeah. No area. protection whatsoever. No, for the monkeys. 65, excuse me. 65. Yeah. Uh, they sold monkey hats, monkey socks, monkey sneakers, monkey this. <coughs> Makes me cough to think about it. Um, Larry and I went to the guild. We said, don't we have protection? No. It's a big, big mistake in the guild's contracts. We've got to, it's, you're going to be a seminal case. We will represent you, but we're going to sue them. So they sued them, and Larry and I got $100,000, 50 each, mm -hmm. better than nothing. Yeah. They got millions. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd never forgive them, ever, because Bob Ravidson was well-to-do. They made a fortune for an easy rider. And uh, Bert was rich anyway, the golden boy. Bob's son died in a fire in Aspen. One of his kids, he, he died in a fire. And I, I was broken hearted. And I saw him, in, I'm, I'm not bragging, believe me. I saw him in Beverly Hills and I went up to him and I said, I'm sorry for what happened, and there's nothing I can say that will help you. But I'd like us to be friends again. Let's let's forget what happened with us. I'm okay with it, and we are friends now. Uh, in fact, I've uh, I've been in a couple of his movies. So then, it, what happened? Because because I after Alex, I was supposed to direct seven of the first 13, and I didn't direct any of them. I couldn't work with them. Yeah. So that was another blow. And Larry and I are in the pilot. If you want to see it, you go down to the... Uh, Ocean picture, or the uh, yeah, radio museum, TV. Radio and TV museum. And we have big parts. We're, we're funny as hell. Larry's hilarious. <laughs> I... Uh... <laughs> You know, as, as a side note, I have my my writing partner and I have our names on a <clears throat> on a monkeys, and it's like if people find out, they get excited because there are a certain number of amazing people who are big fans to this day Huge. of the monkeys. And my name is on it every week, yeah. and we get nothing, yeah. nothing. So you and Larry were writing together, and you kept writing together through Alex in Wonderland, yeah, and then. And then you, all of a sudden, with Bloom and Love. It, it ended before it ended. we did Bloom. So what happened? I, I went to Rome to uh, do the scene with Fellini in uh, Alex in Wonderland. There's a scene with Donald Sutherland and Fellini. And there's also a scene with Donald running around the Vatican and all that. Now, there's a line out in the Vatican. I don't know if you know it. You can't cross that line and do any shooting. Mm -hmm. They'll arrest you and they'll get your film. So we hid it in a, in a camera car and we shot him running through a lot of that stuff. They caught us. They took the film. We never got it back. Uh, the Pope saw it. Their committee. It wasn't dirty at all. But they're crazy. That's another story. Anyway, I did the scene with Fellini, and that was a great, great. Uh, have I told you that story at all? We, I'm in Rome, and uh, I tell Larry, while I'm there, I'll, uh, I'll shoot the scene with Fellini, and then I'll come back. And then I'll go back again while you're cleaning up the movie, the producing side of it. Mm -hmm. I'll go back and get him to, uh, I don't know, do loop or do lines, and who knows what. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm i in my house on the, in Bangkok Park, and the phone rings, and it's a guy named Mario Longardi. 
פה זה מלך עולם ואלד, הכל יהיו תלויי, ייבדנו, זה 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 טיים, זה מלך שלו, זה צ'יינג' את המיין, זה כן הדור, אני אגיד תודה רבה שאתם אומרים לי שאני אגיד תודה רבה, ואני אגיד, אני אגיד את הכל, 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 Kovacs, the cameraman, makeup and hair, uh, a crew of about eight, ten people. We all go to Rome the next day. So you knew that the guy said yeah. he doesn't want to do it. And he, oh, yeah. The guy gets on the phone when I call him. He said, I told you you didn't, he didn't want to do it. I said, I must have had a bad connection because the line was shaky and this and that. I said, but look, I'm, I'm here, so why? What? What's the big deal? He said, I will, I will not tell the maestro. You tell him he's a Cesarino now. He's having his dinner. You tell him, not me. I refuse. Thanks, Mario. So I go to Cesarino, and it's a restaurant, a Bolognese restaurant that Federico Fellini started with this woman. He's from Rimini, which is Bolognese food. The most fattening. Delicious, fatty, greasy pork, and this and that and this. And I go, and I come in, and the woman knew me, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Cesarina. That was her name. Oh, Mr. Mazursky. The, the Mazursky is sitting over there. I'm sure he would like to see you. He was eating, you see. And he was putting the pasta on a spoon, you know, the way they do it. looking down and eating a swallow. And I walk over and I stand there so he doesn't see my face. And I go, Bueno sera, Federico. Yo sono Paulino. He goes, All right, I'll do it. <laughs> That's a true story. So he did it. <laughs> And, uh, and Larry's back in the States, we're back in the cleaning States. things up. Right. I get back to Larry. Larry says, I got big news. I'm uh, divorcing you. And I'm divorcing my wife. And I want to start Four Star. I want to buy it. <laughs> I start to laugh. I said, Larry, are you putting me on? No. I had a... Marathon encounter, just me and Marvin Walkenstein's wife, who's a therapist, a Gestalt therapist. And she told me that I got to do these things. I have to break with my marriage is no good. And I, I love you, but I want to be on my own. I want to direct myself. I want to star. I want to write an opera. I said, you want someone to go to the bathroom with you? Larry, are you kidding? No. What's this about? Four stories says, we, we've made a lot of money from all this. Uh, if we invest it, they're looking for a buyer. So I hope you come in with me. I'll pay you $100,000 a year. I said, Larry, if I'll help you in any way I can, but I... I You can't, can't do that. I, I think you're making a mistake. You could still be my producer. You can go out and try to do all these things and do them. But that doesn't mean we can't. No, it does. He says, and you know I love you. I said, I know. So that's what happened with Larry. How did you feel, Paul, when he talked to you? I was hurt. But I, was, I wasn't afraid. And the truth is, I confess, I was relieved. It was time for me to go on myself. Because I then wrote about five movies in a row that I wrote myself. And it was my best writing. Next Up, Greenwich Village, mm -hmm. An Unmarried Woman, yes. Bloom in Love. I wrote all those myself. 